Hi, class. This is Dr. E. When we met last in class, we were talking about the digestive system, and we never got the chance to actually finalize the chapter. So here it is. We talked about the um, different functions of the liver, and now we're going to talk about some clinical applications on that. So what happens if somebody um, needs a liver transplant? A liver, as you've seen with all of the functions of the liver, um, is required in order to live. Okay, Without a liver, um, that is incompatible with life. As long as you have um, some healthy liver, the healthy portions are able to regenerate. Okay, so if, about, if you have about a quarter of a healthy liver, that would be enough to kind of keep you uh, alive for a while and um, is capable of regeneration. And even in donation, you don't really have to donate the whole liver, just a portion of the liver, and then um, you know whatever you donated, that could be regenerated as well. So as you can see again, um, liver is compatible. Not having a liver is incompatible with life. So if cancer spreads throughout the whole liver, again, that person will not be able to survive. Hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver, and there are different causes of hepatitis. The most common cause um, is the hepatitis virus. And there are so many different kinds of virus. Um, hep C or hepatitis C virus is one of the most common. It is um, the one that is more chronic, meaning that it could last for a long period of time as opposed to acute hepatitis, where in acute hepatitis, the patient gets um, hepatitis and then is cured, while in chronic, the virus persists in the liver and keeps on destroying the liver tissue and where the liver now at the end will become fibrotic. Okay. So hepatitis, as I mentioned, can be either acute or chronic. And, um, and the, some of the symptoms to keep in mind are obviously a fever because it's an infection, and then a lot of times they would patients would become jaundiced or become yellow in color. Their skin becomes yellow in color. Um, most of the time, the they transmitted by contact with through fecal oral routes, so um, the virus would be transmitted through the feces, and then due to um, unclean hands. Those viruses would be transmitted to food, and then it would be eaten up by somebody else. And know that antibiotics are not effective against hepatitis because it's a viral-caused infection. Um, antibiotics have no effect on viruses. They can only affect um, bacteria. Next on the list is to talk about bile. Bile is that um, it's a yellowish-green liquid that is made by hepatocytes. So remember we said that bile is made by the hepatic cells, but it is stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. It's made mainly of water. And then you also have bile salts, and bile salts are made out of cholesterol. And those bile salts are very important in order for the body to digest and absorb fat together with the fat-soluble vitamins. So bile salts emulsify fat, and emulsification means that it breaks that bigger molecule of fat into smaller molecules. Um, it's also known as saponification. So if you've ever seen those commercials where you have a pan full of oil um, and then they put a drop of liquid soap and then that fat just disperses, in, um, that's what emulsification or saponification is. Um, so, um, and these bile salts are the only part of bile that has any digestive function. Bile pigments, which are the bilirubin and biliverdin, those are metabolites from hemoglobin breakdown. So if you go back to how hemoglobin, how the body or how the liver breaks down hemoglobin, um, there, some of the products were bilirubin and biliverdin, and those kind of give the characteristic color of bile and then the characteristic color of feces as well. Bile also has cholesterol and has electrolytes in them. Here you can see the gallbladder. It is on the lower surface of the liver. You'd have to flip the liver on the inferior surface to see the gallbladder. And again, um, like I said, it's where the bile will be concentrated and stored until it's needed. And then you could see here the cystic duct, and that's the duct that will take the bile from the gallbladder into, um, into the uh, duodenum. It joins, though, the common hepatic duct. So what happens is that you have a right and a left common you have a right and a sorry a right and a left 
um, hepatic duct, and then those are going to combine to make a common hepatic duct. That common hepatic duct is going to join the cystic duct to make a bile duct, or also known as a common bile duct. So the common bile duct is a combination of, or, or the joining of the cystic duct with the common hepatic duct. And then as we mentioned um, previously, that the common bile duct is going to join the pancreatic duct and they both open on the major duodenal papilla in the duodenum. And it's regulated by a sphincter that we call the hepatopancreatic sphincter. A, a common problem of gallbladder would be cholecystitis, which is inflammation of the gallbladder, and the formation of gallstones. So here you can see these gallstones. Here you can see these gallstones that are formed in the gallbladder, and they're usually due to um, maybe over concentration of bile. So remember, we said that bile is stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. If you over concentrate bile, that will lead to crystallization. So you have these um, usually made out of cholesterol. Okay, these if they block the cystic duct, it becomes a very painful gallbladder attack. Okay, so obviously that will prevent bile from reaching um, the duodenum, and it will definitely affect the digestion and the absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins. For the regulation of bile, for the regulation of bile release, as I mentioned, we, um, we'll kind of go through, since we can see the duct system here a lot clearer than in the previous picture, you have the two hepatic ducts, and they combine to make a common hepatic duct. That common hepatic duct joins the cystic duct to make a common bile duct. And that common bile duct opens together with the pancreatic duct at the major duodenal papilla, and that is controlled by the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So in order to release bile, you want to contract the gallbladder and relax that sphincter, and that is the function of CCK or cholecystokinin. So cholecyst means gallbladder and kinin means to activate. So when you can see here now this chyme being released from the stomach into the duodenum, now the duodenal cells are going to release CCK. CCK through the bloodstream will reach the gallbladder and that would stimulate the gallbladder wall to contract and it, that CCK also um, relaxes the sphincter. So when you do that, now bile is able to be pushed through here and then goes into the duodenum um, where it will be mi mixed up with the chyme and assist now in the fat digestion. So functions of bile salt, as I said, it would be emulsification or also known as the process of saponification where it break down, breaks down the bigger fat globules into smaller droplets and, and that helps um, increase the surface area for the lipase enzyme in order to um, digest these fat molecules. Okay. And because it helps the absorption of fat, it also helps the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K. Um, bile salts, not only do they help in the absorption of fatty acids, but also cholesterol and baking them into little micelles. And micelles are very... are. Um, fat surrounded by protein. So remember, fat is not water soluble. You cannot um, really transport fat in the blood unless you surround it by a protein coat. And that's what myoceles are. So myoceles are pretty much a protein coat. And on, inside of that coat, you're going to find um, some fatty acid and cholesterol. When bile salts reach the large intestine, in the small intestine, they are going to be reabsorbed and recycled so, the, so that we don't lose all of those bile salts in the feces. Now for moving on to the small intestine, okay, that is the longest part of the digestive system, okay? It's made out of three different parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Um, you could remember them in order, you want to remember them in order, it would be DJI or duodenum, jejunum, and then the ileum. It extends all the way from the pyloric sphincter of the stomach all the way until it reaches the large intestine. And it 
attaches to the large intestine in an area known as the ileocecal valve. Okay. It fills most of the abdominal cavity. It receives the chyme from the stomach. It also rece receives the um, pancreatic juice. It receives, the, um, it receives bile from the gallbladder. And this is where really we need to finalize digestion. And this is where most nutrients are absorbed. So the majority of digestion and the majority of absorption is really done in the small intestine. And this is where, like I said, we have to finalize digestion of all of the products. Okay. So again, parts of the small intestine in order, we have the duodenum, jejunum, and then the ileum. The duodenum is the shortest one. It's that C-shaped um, part that starts from the pyloric sphincter. And then in it, you'll find like a, um, wedged in that C-shaped area, you'll find the, uh, the pancreas. And into the duodenum, you have the major duodenal papilla, and that's, again, where your common bile duct and your pancreatic duct open into the area. The, the, ju the jejunum, that's the middle portion, and it is more active than the ileum. The ileum part, that's the distal portion, and it has lots of lymph nodes like known as Peyer's patches. Those, again, are going to try to kind of um, get any germs that are trying to... Uh, get in with the food that we're absorbing or the nutrients that we're absorbing and that that ileum ends in by entering into the colon but there is a sphincter there known as the ileocolic sphincter the small intestine is covered by a double fold of peritoneum that double fold is known as a greater omentum the greater omentum kind of looks like a curtain or a drape that keeps all of the intestines in place. And I'll show you the picture on the next slide. Um, I also want to introduce why we're here, the mesentery. And the mes you have all of these loops of intestine, okay? So the jejunum and the, duod and the uh, ileum. And you would have tons and tons of blood vessels and nerves um, tangled within the abdominal cavity as well. So what the mesentery does, it provides kind of a pathway for these blood vessels and nerves and lymphatics to reach the intestinal loops without getting tangled um, with among all of these loops. So I'll show you the pictures here. This is the greater omentum. The greater omentum um, is actually edible. So, um, and it is called the, hold on, let me check it because I wrote it down somewhere, call fat or lace fat or fat netting. It's basically um, connective tissue with uh, lots of fat, and it comes from the greater curvature of the stomach, and it drapes all the way down, and it really tucks in the, or keeps the loops of the intestine in their position. And you can see it does bring in some blood vessels as well. So in order to see the small intestines, you would have to remove that drape, remove the greater omentum, and when you remove the greater momentum, you can now see all of the loops of the intestine with the mesentery attached to it. So the mesentery, again, is how these loops will get their blood vessels, um, the arteries. You can see here the red artery, the blue vein, and the green, and that would be for lymphatics. Okay, so that, again, you don't really have all of these, um, you know, the loops of the intestines all tangled up with all of these blood vessels. Next would be the structure of the small intestinal wall. So it has all of the four layers that we've talked about previously that, again, extends throughout the elementary canal. If you look at the picture of the intestine, it, this right here is a picture of the intestine from the inside. And you can see all of these different waves. These waves are known as plica circularis. And that is to increase the surface area or to increase the contact between the nutrients and the small intestine to enhance or to improve or to the more surface area or the more contact between the nutrients and the small intestine, the more um, nutrients will be absorbed. You can see all of these different waves that we call this plica circularis, and on top of that, there are villi. So that even further increases the surface area. If you look at a microscopic picture of each villus, it is lined on the outside by the simple columnar epithelium, 
And in the middle of each villus, you have connective tissue with an artery, a vein, and lymphatics. That lymphatic is known as a lacteal, and that's where the um, fat is going to be absorbed. And we'll talk about the absorption of fat. So everything that we absorb goes through the blood supply, okay, except for fat. Most fat is absorbed and goes to the lacteals first or the lymphatic system before it is dumped into the circulatory system. You can also see the all four layers, like I mentioned, the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa, just like, you know, throughout all the, um, the elementary canal. And here you can see again that villus that we talked about. What you're looking at here, this is a picture of the simple columnar epithelium that's on top. So even that simple columnar epithelium has microvilli. Again, trying to increase the surface area as much as possible, trying to increase the um, contact between the small intestinal, the mucosa of the small intestine, and the contents that are passing by, all of those nutrients. In these microvilli, you have the final enzymes that finalize the digestion of different products, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Some of the secretions of the small intestine, we talked about most of these. Um, so we talked about the secretions that come out of the duodenum, the CCK and the somatostatin, for example. Um, we also have Brunner's glands, and those make a very um, thick alkalinic mucus, and that is obviously to neutralize all the acidity that was coming from the stomach. Other intestinal glands secrete a watery fluid, and that helps to, to um, pick up all of the digestive products. So everything that we're going to absorb, you want to kind of dilute it a little bit, so that helps with the digestion and helps with absorption as well. The enzymes that are found in the microvilli, which are all the way up here, okay, so these microvilli have enzymes, as I mentioned, and that part, these, that microvilli is known as the brush border, okay. These are the final enzymes that are going to finalize the steps of digestion. So you have peptidases, and that'll break down peptides into its monomers or into these small amino acids. Sucrase, maltase, and lactase are going to break down the disaccharides um, into their monosaccharides. So sucrase will obviously break down sucrose. Maltase breaks down, breaks down maltose, and lactase breaks down lactose. Okay, if individuals who are lactose intolerant are lacking that lactase enzyme, so they do not have the ability to break down lactose into its two monomer monosaccharides, we, our intestines do not have the ability to absorb a disaccharide. So it will not be able to absorb lacto lactose enzyme, um, the lactose sugar. And that lactose sugar will be remain in the small intestine. It will ferment, it will cause lots of gases. It'll also cause diarrhea because it'll go down the system um, in the feces, bringing down lots of water with it by osmosis. And that's the whole concept of being lactose intolerant. Another enzyme that is found in the brush border is known as lipase, and that again is going to finalize the breakdown of fat into the fatty acids and glycerol. So just like any secretions, we need to know how do the how are the small intestinal secretions regulated? So the goblet cells as we sell that makes the very thick kind of alkalinic mucus, and that would be stimulated by the acid contact with chyme, which is very acidic. And also mechanical stimulation, so the stretch of the small intestine is going to stimulate making these goblet cells to make more mucus. Also the distension is going to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, and when you stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system, that's going to increase both um, movement and um, secretions. Absorption, as I said, most absorption happens in the small intestine through these um, microvilli that we've talked about. So when the, all of the enzymes in the microvilli finalize um, absorption, we're going to start absorbing now all of these monomers. So the amino acids, the monosaccharides, and the fatty acids and glycerol. So we we'll kind of go through, one, through them one at a time. We want to kind of walk through the digest digestion and absorption of each um, ev of everything we eat. So we'll talk about the carbs, and then we'll talk about proteins, and then lipids. So for carbs, 
Remember, we said that the very first enzyme that starts the digestion of carbs was in the saliva, so salivary amylase that is going to start the digestion of carbs um, and breaking it down into disaccharides. We also have pancreatic amylase, and that works in the small intestine. It's not until we reach, again, the intestinal brush border where the disaccharides through these lipase enzymes are going to break down into their monosaccharides. Oh, I'm sorry, not the lipase, I apologize. The sucrase, maltase, and lactase are going to digest these disaccharides into the monosaccharides. Now, these monosaccharides are going to be absorbed by facilitated diffusion and active transport and will go straight into the blood system. For protein, um, protein digestion doesn't start until it reaches the stomach. Okay, and pepsin um, is one of the first enzymes that works on protein and starts to, uh, breaking it down into polypeptides. Remember, pepsin and actually all protein enzymes are released in an inactive form that have to be activated. So pepsin is really released by the stomach in the form of pepsinogen, and then it's activated by the hydrochloric acid into pepsin. So if somebody is not making hydrochloric acid, they won't be able to activate pepsin, and that would affect their protein digestion. Other, um, the rest of the proteases come out of the pancreas, for example, trypsin, chymotrypsin. Um, all of these, again, come out as inactive forms, so trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and then they have to be activated. But these are going to break down the proteins into smaller peptides. It's not until, again, we reach the brush border where the intestinal peptidases that are found in the microvilli that are going to break down these peptides into the monomers of amino acids. And the intestine will be able to absorb these amino acids by active transport, again, straight into the bloodstream. When we talk about fat, okay, fat first off, have to be emulsified. We have to break it down. We have to break down these bigger fat or globs of fat, okay, by the bile salts. Okay, and fats are mainly digested by the enzymes of the pancreas and the small intestine um, with the help of these bile salts. Fats have to be digested into glycerol and fatty acids. So our body can only absorb glycerol and fatty acids. But it's, it's a more of a complicated process and most fat is not, and we're going to go over that process in the next slide. Um, know, though, that fat, although some of it is absorbed into the blood, but most of it goes into the lacteals. Most is absorbed into the lymphatic capillaries first. So let me talk about the fat absorption in this using this in picture here. So that is the brush border. Okay, This is the lumen of the small intestine. And you can see here your fatty acids um, and glycerol that are being absorbed into the intestinal cell. And then through the action of the smooth ER, they are going to be made into chylomicrons. And remember chylomicrons, or that purple thing that you see here, that is made out of a protein coat surrounding um, the fat. Okay, because again, fat cannot be transported in water because it is water insoluble. So we, although we broke it down here, we are going to reassemble it in the endoplasmic reticulum into these chylomicrons. And then these chylomicrons are going to be absorbed through the lymphatics before they go to the bloodstream. Okay. Um, for the water and electrolyte absorption, um, well, water doesn't need to be digested, obviously, but it is going to just follow electrolytes by osmosis. Um, water, not just following electrolytes, it also follows the absorption of anything. So the absorption of sugars, amino acids, especially the sugar and electrolytes, um, those are going to pull in water by osmosis and again through into the blood capillaries. Electrolytes are absorbed by diffusion and active transport, and those are also absorbed into the blood capillaries. So you see that everything is absorbed into the blood system except for fat that has to be, those are absorbed mainly through the lacteals first, and then it reaches the, 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 um, the um, circulatory system. For movements of the small intestine, we have the peristaltic movement, and that is the wave-like movement that pushes or that propels the chyme throughout the small intestine. Um, and segmentation, these are ring-like contractions be, mixing the chyme with all of the juices and all of the enzymes 
coming from whether it's bile or the pancreatic secretions. So that mixing movement helps to break down the chyme and increase the contact of these digestive enzymes with chyme. Parasympathetic stimulation, as we mentioned before, that's your resting and digesting system. So that is going to increase both peristaltic movements um, and, the, and the segmentation movement, and it'll also increase your secretions, while sympathetic would inhibit all of that. The ileosphincter, ileocecal sphincter, and that's the sphincter that connects the small intestine or the terminal ileum, which is the terminal part of the small intestine, to the cecum, which is the very beginning of the large intestine. Okay, um, we would have to relax that so that the chyme can go from the small intestine into the large intestine. That So it helps in the regulation of flow of chyme. In the case of diarrhea, there would be um, either irritation of the intestinal wall by a germ or over distension, so overeating, and that, could lead, that would lead to a very strong peristaltic rush. And if that rush happens, that means there is no time to absorb the nutrients. So all of the nutrients with all of the water that was in there is going to be rushed out. Um, it will be pushed into the large intestine and then rushed out of the body, and that would result in diarrhea. The large intestine <clears throat> is named so because it's, it has a bigger diameter. Okay, at the distal end of it, it opens out... Um, out of the body through the anus there is a little bit of absorption that happens in this large intestine and that's just you know kind of finalizing the absorption of electrolytes in water so that um, you know we don't lose any of these electrolytes it also helps in the recycling of um, the bile salts if you guys remember and it also um, resorts re recycles some of the digestive secretions so all of these enzymes that release the bile salts the pancreatic enzymes um, the body would want to recycle those and not lose them in, in the feces. And the final and last function for the large intestine is to form and store these feces and then obviously eliminate them. So parts of the large intestine, and I'm going to use the picture for this. You have here, this is the cecum. Okay, the cecum means a dead end, and that's really what it is. So it's a dead end pouch. Um, attached to it, you'll find the appendix, and the appendix is has no digestive or absorptive functions whatsoever. It is a patch of lymphatic tissue found at that point of junction between the ileum and the cecum in order, again, to trap any germs trying to um, sneak in. Okay, you can see here the ileocecal valve, and that's where the ileum will open up into the cecum. And then you have the ascending colon and the transverse colon and then the descending colon. Then you have the sigmoid colon, so sigmoid means S-shaped, so there's your S-shaped sigmoid colon, and the rectum, and that's where the feces are going to be stored until um, um, defecation occurs. Then there's the anal canal and the anus. So something, you know, a little pe of peculiar things that you could see here. You can also see the mesentery, and that mesentery is going to be bringing, as you can see here, the blood supply. <coughs> the blood su supply to the different parts of the large intestine. You also have these two corners here. The corner on the right is known as the right colic flexure, also known as the hepatic flexure because the liver would be right on top of it. Um, the left corner is known as the left colic pressure flexure, also known as the splenic flexure because, again, the spleen would be right on top of this. Okay. You can see that... Um, this tinea coli, which is a band of connective tissue. Um, so as I was mentioning, you find this um, band um, known as the tinea coli, and that tinea coli is, um, is actually, it's not a band of connective tissue, it is a third layer of muscle. Fibers that extend throughout the length of the colon and that leads to, and it pulls on the colon, and you can see here that it leads to these pouches, and these pouches are known as hostrations or hostra. So this phenomenon of having hostra or pouches is only found in the large intestine, but it is not found in the small intestine, and that is due to that extra um, smooth muscle layer known as the tinea coli. So there it is, the tinea coli, and again, it leads to the hostrations or the pouches. 
And these pouches really kind of give the um, feces their characteristic shapes. If you look on the inside of the um, anal canal, the rectum, anal canal, and then the anus, you can see here that it has these, um, um, these ridges, and that is, again, to allow for distension. And then it is that distension that stimulates the whole um, defecation reflex. So part of the defecation reflex would be um, the involvement of these two sphincters. So you have an internal anus, anal sphincter and an external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is involuntary. The external anal sphincter is voluntary. So the reflex, if this area is now full of feces and um, the stretch is going to activate the defecation reflex, by reflex, the internal anal sphincter is going to relax. So it is really up to the person to relax the external anal sphincter. So that again is something voluntary done. It is not until the situations are suitable, so the person is in the bathroom, and then they would relax the external anal sphincter, increase the abdominal pressure by um, valsalva movements they're known as, which would be pretty much contracting the abdominal muscles and relaxing the pelvic muscles, and that would lead to the um, release of the feces. If you look again at the microscopic picture of the large intestinal wall, again, it has the three layers. So remember the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa on the outside. Um, again, like as I mentioned before, the muscularis, though, has that third band layer known as the coli that runs throughout the whole colon and leads to these hostrations. Um, the mucosa, though, unlike the small intestine, it does not have the plica circularis and it does not have the villi or microvilli. Because again, um, those are really related to digestion, increasing the surface area um, and the contact between the mucosa and the small intestine and the chyme. And that is not the function of the large intestine. So we don't need hit these plica circularis or the villi and microvilli. These are not things that are found in the large intestine. But what is unique to the large intestine is that tinea coli and these hostrations. So what are the functions of the large intestine? <clears throat> As I said, it really has no, it's a very limited function when it comes to digestion, okay, because okay, everything has been digested at this point, um, and for the most part, everything has been absorbed as well. It has goblet cells to make mucus. So remember, goblet cells anywhere in the body are going to be making mucus. Mucus, it helps in lubrication, um, you know, for the passage of the feces. It helps absorb water. Okay, so again, we have to want to finalize the absorption of water and electrolytes in the large intestine. It also has what are known as intestinal flora. <clears throat> intestinal flora are healthy bacteria living in the large intestine. We need those bacteria to make certain vitamins, for example, vitamin K, vitamin B12, and thiamine. Okay, and... Um, through that, if we do not have that or the lack of that intestinal flora would lead to um, the deficiency of these vitamins. And again, of course, obviously, the um, last function of the large intestine would be forming feces and the carrying out of the defecation process. Movements of the large intestine, we don't have as much movement in the large intestine as we do in the small intestine, although we do have um, we still have the mixing movements. We also still have the peristaltic movements, but they are much less um, in the, um, we don't have them as often. They're much less often than in the small intestine. So for peristaltic movements, it, it is very variable from one person to another. Some, somebody could have a bowel movement uh, maybe once a day, twice a day, every two days. So it is very variable having these mass movements or these um bowel movements. We do also have a gastrocolic reflex, and I believe I kind of mentioned that during lecture. The gastrocolic reflex starts in the stomach and ends in the colon or in the large intestine. And what happens is that when you start eating, so that stretch of the gastric um, wall is going to stimulate the large intestine or the colon to produce these peristaltic waves. And a lot of patients will come in and say, you know what, I really cannot have a bowel movement unless I have something to eat in the morning. And that's what help, makes it easier for me to go to the bathroom. That is because of this gastrocolic reflex. 
Now the def defecation reflex, as I mentioned, the stretch of the um, rectum and the anal canal is going to relax the internal anal sphincter, and it is really up to the individual um, to control the external anal sphincter and relax it when appropriate. The external anal sphincter, that is the sphincter that we teach kids to control. So when they achieve, um, when they are potty trained, um, we are really potty training them to um, control the external anal sphincter. <clears throat> Feces are really everything that our body did not digest or could not digest um, and did not absorb, and we are going to defecate those. It's most feces is made out of um, feces mostly made out of water there's also some electrolytes there's mucus there's bacteria and there's bile pigments the bile pigments that gives you the characteristic color um, although it's not green and yellowish anymore but because of due to the action of bacteria so that bacteria is going to change the color of the bile pigments into a more brownish color um, the odor that comes with feces is really due to these different gases, for example, phenol, hydrogen sulfide, indol, scatol, and ammonia. A couple of diseases that could affect the large intestine are diverticulosis. Diverticulosis are little pouches or protrusions of the mucous membrane. Um, and it'll form, like I said, these little pouches in the wall of the large intestine. So they these pouches... Um, Chyme might remain in these pouches and then they would ferment. So that would lead to the inflammation. It can also lead to diarrhea. Inflammat inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. This is really a group of disorders um, with two different categories. It's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis that affects the mucosa and the submucosa of the large intestine, hence the name colitis. And it causes a very bloody diarrhea with lots of cramps. Crohn's disease is a more serious disease. It affects um, all of the layers of both the large intestine and the small intestine. Again, it also causes diarrhea with um, a painful kind of diarrhea. Colorectal cancer, um, that would be the cancer of the large intestine of, or the rectum. As it stands now, it is the fourth most common cancer in the U.S., there are lots of screening, and that's the good news, that there are um, a couple of screening procedures that we could perform. So there's fecal occult blood in stools, which basically means that the patient will bring in a sample of stool, um, and you'll um, put a little bit of that stool onto a slide, and that could detect occult blood. Occult blood means the blood that you cannot see by the naked eye, so microscopic bleeding that the patient might not be able to tell you about because they can't see it. There are also colonoscopies. Colonoscopies, um, so screening colonoscopies usually start at the age of 50 unless there is maybe a personal history, obviously, of colon cancer or a very strong history, family history of colon cancer, that it would start at an earlier age. Um, but the recommendations are to have the first baseline colonoscopy at the age of 50, and then um, if the patient is low risk, they would have one done every 10 years um, unless... <clears throat> symptoms develop than they would have one earlier. Lifespan changes that could happen throughout the digestive system, they are very slow and very gradual. Um, so starting from the oral cavity, the teeth enamel can become thin, the teeth become more sensitive, um, the gums will start to recede, you, um, you can even start losing teeth, you know, they can fall because of all of the gum recession. The GI tract becomes a little bit less efficient, so a lot of patients will tell you, you know what, I never had problems drinking milk, but now um, I think I've become lactose intolerant, um, and that is due to the um, loss, again, of that lactase enzyme, and that is something that could be developed, that patients can develop as they age. Okay, constipation becomes more frequent. The secretions that come out of the um, gas, the stomach, slows down so they're not as much as they used to be and peristalsis becomes very slow and that could lead to heartburn. The accessory organs, so for example the liver and the pancreas and so on, these really do not age as much and then they're bigger organs so even if you lose some uh, function it really <clears throat> does not affect um, health in general. Now this concludes the digestive system. Um, please let me know if you have any questions.